Welcome back to Between Two Racks with the Kilo Crew. On today's episode, we're going to cover introducing power training to general population. And we're being specific when we're saying general population. So let's kick it. So before I let Steph loose on power (laughs) training specifically, I want us to clarify, I know we've said it before, but what we mean by general population. The first thing we always like to say is we're general population. We're general population. But beyond that. I feel like there's like two categories of gen pop. Like a lot of the clients I've trained are gen pop. You know, they're Have women. zero interest in power training. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> so there's those people. And then there's the injured people, which are not necessarily gen pop. But gen pop is someone who is able, who is willing, who's excited about training, who spends time in the gym, Maybe a weekend warrior type of person plays different sports and stuff, but they have no limitations in terms of training. And they're motivated, basically, because you have to, if you're going to do power training, you're not just training like two days a week, just kind of doing random stuff. You have to have a good base and like ready to go. Yeah. And then anything else for Gen Pop Pork that you think kind of separates in regards to... Well, what we're saying what here we're is Gen Pop is anyone who wants to train, can train, can be even trained for a sport that is not elite or highly advanced in a sport. So like as Alex was saying, like weekend warriors, yes, like I would still consider that Gen Pop, especially in the case of power training, whereas how we would manage our power training for more elite level athletes is it's different does that cover everything you think we need to say on what the gen pop is in regards to the training yeah but you you could add that the, the thing is the athletic population the power training that you're doing is for one purpose only and it's to improve power output on the field of whatever sport the athlete is doing. So the training of power in the weight room in the off season for the athlete will be highly specific to the demands of the sport. Now, what we're talking about when you're gen pop and you're not preparing for an event or a sporting event per se, and you're just strength training year round and you want a change of pace and you want to incorporate power to your training, then there's no such thing as super specific modes of action. So we're just think talking about improving power uh, more on a neuromuscular perspective in the context of strength training exercises, not as much as power in order for uh, a quick change of direction in a cut as a running back or jumping over like two defense, two defensive back as a wide receiver. It's not that specific. It's more, okay, we're bench pressing. I have a decent amount of maximal strength. Now I want to generate more power. What can I do in the weight room to generate more power on bench press? We introduced power into our training this year. So we were more on the lines, especially me with you were just first introducing the power to me. And that's because I had years of doing slower tempo. So now slower tempo, what I mean is just like, building up my strength at four zero x zero and then this year was the first year you actually introduced just a faster tempo in the a series with me even so that was kind of my first introduction to power with me because let's not forget that what nine years ago or eight years ago you did olympic weightlifting which is very power dominant you did it for six months but yeah with me it was your first exposure um so the thing is, power is great, but the training needs to be ready for it. So if you're going to train power, you need to first build a base with slower eccentric tempo. And I'm being specific because I don't want to say slow tempo because slow tempo could be yeah. three zero three zero. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about a slow eccentric, but still a fast concentric but why you want the slow eccentric, there's multiple reasons. Reason number one is it prolong your time under tension in the eccentric contraction, which helps build somewhat of a base of strength of eccentric strength. 
which is the basis of strength. It helps build tendon resiliency because you need a certain amount of time under tension in order to build strong connective tissue. You need at least 30 seconds of time under tension in order for the connective tissue tendons and ligaments to really strengthen itself. And you need to, you need to have strong tendons and ligaments if you're going to do power. Yeah, you do. And also a third thing that the slow eccentric does is it gives the trainee enough time to work on positioning on certain multi-joint movements. So if you're squatting and your technique is a little off, well, spending more time in the eccentric gives you enough time to auto-correct the trajectory of your position through the movement pattern. So there's lots of advan- advantages to... Uh, uh, slower eccentric even on the hypertrophy perspective there's some benefit as well which we know hypertrophy is ideal in the early stages of training so you need that slower eccentric tempo to build that base now if you want to build power eventually you need to move on to a can i yeah. ask a question yes so when you're talking about the slow eccentrics are you only talking about the a series four zero x zero or you're you're incorporating extended eccentrics and the b series and like different techniques like that no i'm not i'm not talking about specialty techniques i'm really just talking about like your standard isotonic training to be performed with a slower eccentric tempo so with the novice we love with the uh, multi-joint long range movement we love starting with a four zero one zero or four zero x zero Uh, Four seconds seems to be that sweet spot where it's slow enough to build that base, not so slow that it becomes a pure eccentric technique, which affects the loading. Four seconds, if you're really not used to it, it will affect the loading negatively. But as soon as you have a three, six months behind your belt, then the difference in load is not that big compared to a three or two second eccentric. But that's what I'm talking about. Like the B series, you know, the reps are higher. Sometimes we're talking about single joint or, or, or multi joint movement with slightly shorter range of motion. You can afford to do a three zero one zero. So this typically, the B and C series are standard tempo. Typically, is a three zero one zero. But we like to start with a four zero one zero. Now, after a year or so of true dedicated training if you want to move towards power because if you're just like a regular gen pop like the 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 first category you were talking about alex that has zero interest in power training that has that that's training more for health purposes Honestly, I, I don't see the point in moving away from a 4010 because I think that's the just that sweet spot that's great for learning, great for a stimulus, build, uh, muscle. build yeah. some muscle mass, build some strength, but it's not too stressful for the connective tissue and on and on. So to me, there's no reason. But if you have somebody a little bit more motivated that wants to really build high levels of strength, that wants to to move on to power, that just wants to be a beast, but that's not an athlete, then you need to start training faster. And by training faster is simply you progressively speed up the eccentric contraction down to a three zero x zero to maybe a two zero x zero. And then only if you're really elite and really advanced, maybe a one zero x zero, like the way an Olympic lifter would squat, for example. But you need that full control yeah. and full body awareness. But it's harder than it looks. I know it, you guys struggle is. when you're like used to doing four zero x zero and then you do two it's like whoa yeah especially once you get above like 80 yeah. percent and that's what most people have, don't really do is once they get over 80 percent they normally like naturally slow down slightly or they try and rush it and miss the lift but they naturally slow down that way whereas if you're trying to maintain that two zero x zero tempo mm-hmm. with that there you really have to have very good control and very good like awareness of where you are in space so and i think it goes back again even with personally for myself going to that faster tempo goes back to the tendon resiliency because when you are using the percent of load that you're supposed to be doing and you're doing it faster (laughs) you feel it (laughs) like that's when you know like it's a heavy load like on bench you know your elbows once you start really accelerating the load like it's very different and that's why it's so important to have 
the tendon resiliency once you start introducing yeah. that type of training. but but it's it's so important to have really really good eccentric control yeah. eccentric is the in my opinion that's just an opinion piece it's my it's the basis of everything because the eccentric contraction is the part of the movement where, where you're ac- actually storing kinetic energy for elasticity. Yeah. So you're storing it. So that's why at one point, if you want to be powerful and all you ever do is train slow, you never get to the point where you're truly storing enough energy eccentrically to propulse the concentric action to be super powerful. So if you get to the point where you've trained slow, you've built that resiliency, you've built that eccentric control through a full range of motion so that your joints are fully healthy across the board, and now you slowly introduce faster speed at high loads, now what happens is your tissue, your tendons become more efficient at storing kinetic energy during that eccentric contraction so that now as you trans translate from your eccentric contraction to your concentric contraction so the stretch shortening cycle now you have all of this stored energy that's ready to be transferred into your concentric action which results in more force or more power output But without that, you're never going to be powerful. So that's why the first step for power is to simply start lifting heavy weights fast. And what even compounds that further is once you're doing a faster eccentric, you're creating larger eccentric peak forces. So you're actually going to be storing even more kinetic energy just due to the faster eccentric so you'll even more potential once you have the ability to utilize that ex- the kinetic energy so when you're first introducing a faster tempo um i'm sure some of the students will ask like intensity wise so let's say if you're you know the intensity five reps 85 percent, but you're it's your first exposure at going faster would you start would you do the 85 percent, or would you just be like hey let's start like five no we would start lighter so that's a good question but the way you need to look at it is if i'm changing tempo if i'm saying okay client x now we're going to speed up your eccentric tempo i'm not going to do this in phase four of a macro cycle I'm going to do this in phase one, week one of a new macro cycle. So assuming we're using undulating periodization or even linear periodization, it doesn't matter. Week one, phase one of a macro, guess what? The intensity is always lower. Okay, so you start at at a lower intensity no matter what. So let's say that we're doing a, a, a basic macro, uh, let's say an absolute strength macro, very conservative and the first phase is at 74%, which is 10 reps. So you might be doing 4 by 10, but now that 4 by 10 will be performed with a 2-0x0 tempo instead of a 4-0x0 tempo. So at least now you're learning, you're introducing that faster eccentric, but at, at a much lower load, much lower intensity, so it's more manageable. And then as you get used that 2x0 to zero x zero tempo and we're progressing through the macro now phase two intensification one the intensity will increase to most likely 83 percent at that point so now okay now you're entering the max strength window and now you need to train max strength at a faster speed but at least it was preceded by a phase of lower intensity yeah um, one thing on that is when you're changing a variable like tempo as much as that we're not going to introduce that with a complex rep scheme. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be in with standard sets. And then due to that, we're going to do step loading with it anyway. Mm -hmm. So that loan, if you think you need to adjust your loads because the someone is struggling with the faster tempo, you can do that within the step loading parameters Mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So, so all of these steps are really, really important. So that's the thing, right? Like we have a course in our advanced strength um, curriculum called specialty techniques. Specialty techniques are great, but when it comes to speed strength, 
before you even think about specialty techniques, you need to learn, you need to be good at moving heavy weights fast. That's the, that's the main thing. But then you could also, and this is way more important with the gen popper as opposed to the uh, athlete, because the athlete, the athlete, no matter what, because he's active year round, he's playing a sport, he has practices, <clears throat> the athlete typically has some level of joint stiff, uh, tendon stiffness already, okay? But the gen pup, who, for example, hasn't really played a sport in 10 years, uh, doesn't run anymore, uh, and has been doing more like bodybuilding type work, okay? Not only do you need to pr slowly progress to a faster tempo at heavy weight, but you also need to account for spending time to develop joint stiffness. And you want to do that prior to or in conjunction with that phase where you're increasing the velocity of the eccentric. Because if you have zero joint stiffness and you start lifting heavy weight with a fast eccentric, then you don't have the ability for that stretch shortening cycle to be done fast enough. So you have a lot of lost energy in the transition, which translates into less output in the concentric. So one, what, one good thing you can do with that clientele is as part of the dynamic warm-up, you introduce low-grade plyometric work. It can be as simple as pogos, uh, rope jumping, hopping. You know, like it doesn't need to be very complicated. Yeah but you need to start building some type of plyometric action to create some uh, joint uh, tendon stiffness and also reinforce the ability, at least at the ankle joint, mm -hmm. at least, to transition faster from eccentric to concentric because that's the key. Not only do you need to absorb the load eccentrically to create in kinetic energy, you need to learn to trans pose it really really quick to the concentric which is a hard task so the ten, the, the reason why i'm saying that at least the ankle is because this is probably the most fragile of the joints but the knee joint the hip joint the shoulder joint the elbow joint also need to be addressed so for the upper body what would you do like <coughs> oh, push-ups and yeah it, it can be clapping. like uh, uh plyo push-ups it can yeah. be uh, uh um uh, re re repeated med ball throws and catch yep. and stuff like that. <clears throat> but it, it doesn't need to be complicated. It doesn't need to be a ton of volume. That's the other thing. The, 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 we're, we're trying to make you more efficient at generating power in the weight room. So it, it, it like it, it, it can, I'm, I'm not saying that's what it should be, but it could, everything could be sagittal dominant and it would still work because that's the nature of strength, the weight room, okay? Whereas the athlete, you need way more var variability in your, in your actions. Mm -hmm. So you do this in conjunction with increasing the tempo prescription. Now you build the skill uh, to have fast uh, conversion rate. And then at that point, now you can start digging a little deeper and either go through the speed strength continuum or target the limiting factor of power output if you do a battery of test that showcases where you're where you have the biggest limiting factor but in my opinion for gen pop for the context of strength training you're better off just going down the continuum which which goes from heavy slow to progressively lighter and progressively faster if you follow that continuum, it's an easy, natural progression to develop power output. Yeah, then for the warm-up, it's specifically important to really work on more extensive um, plyometric activities. So like Steph was saying, the pogo. So it'd be, it's way more beneficial for these type of clients to be doing pogo with tr the intention of completing as many reps as possible within a period of time, more so than going for height on each rep. So you're getting more contacts 
So we're really trying to build the resiliency of the tenants instead of maximizing their output. So, and then it's important again to go from bilateral to unilateral, especially if they're planning to do any sort of sprinting. So like a good progression would be like, so you do your dynamic stretching then you move into some level of low grade extensive pogo for a set time, 20 to 30 seconds you can do a couple sets of that, short rest in between. Then you can move into something like ankling. So it's just a very small lift of your, you're pretty much, you're bringing your foot over the... A uh, mini skip. Yeah, like it's, <laughs> o- it's over the support leg's ankle yeah. to start there. So then you're, uh, that's the, the only forces you are absorbing is from ankle height down. And then you can move on to something more like an A skip, B skip, and move into more intensive, like and more intensive pogo. So, just slowly bringing up the intensity throughout, but really in those early stages, focus more on the low grade, extensive plyometrics because that's going to be the most bang for your buck long term. And as you get more efficient with power training, you can bring in more of the intensive, more of the jumps and yeah. stuff like that. And even when you put together the extensive warm up, we went through together. It was kind of like every time. We did it, you added a little bit more intensity and even yep. intensity in the specifics of what we were doing, but also just the output we were yeah. actually giving to the warm up every and time the we amplitude, did it. Right? Yeah. So you started with small and then you just went bigger and bigger. In yeah. Terms so of jumps. another really good thing is week to week. So you can start that the warm up, you could have the exact same warm up as a layout and then, but place heavy emphasis on the volume of the extensive stuff at the start. And then as the weeks progress, you reduce the volume in the extensive and increase the volume in the intensive stuff. So say you have a 10-minute long extensive plyometric warm-up and week one, eight of those minutes are all the small, low-grade, low-amplitude, extensive-based things. Then as the time goes on, that will go from eight minutes of extensive, two minutes of intensive to at the very end of the 12 weeks, it could be two minutes of extensive and eight minutes of intensive. And like from the research, like war, like including power-based stuff in plyometric, um, plyometric warm-up, in the warm-up alone, without doing any more power-based stuff in your training session, your power can go up, like your counter-movement can go up like 20% yeah. from that alone. So yeah. there's a real stimulus there that people don't realize. Like so, if you're just doing your strength training, you add that in top. Obviously, if you're not, if you're very well trained, kind of movement job, it's not going to go up twenty yeah. percent. <laughs> but if you haven't trained it in a while, it really, it really can just go up that easy if you're very meticulous with the inclusion of it. I think the warm ups also a good chance on two different things. Like first off, it's a good opportunity to get used to some form of faster movements if you haven't been doing it which is important for this type of clientele but also the biggest thing for me was to actually become neurally ready for what I was about to do yep. in my training like I really needed that it wasn't like yes I needed to be warmed up and ready to go into the training but it's the ability to neurally be ready to then hit the weights mm-hmm. and be powerful then the, the other thing that's really important to consider to go along with everything you guys are saying is the, the incidence of injury, like soft tissue injury, increases when you introduce high velocity if you're not used to it. Yeah. So it's really important that all of this is done progressively, but it's also very, very important that the trainee has really good tissue quality. If the trainee is in flame as hell, is you know like sometimes like you you, you manipulate a, a client and like the tissue stiff like you touch yeah. the muscle and it's stiff it's hard there is no there's uh, no give there's yeah no there's no pliability yeah. to steel on uh, Brady's and <laughs> 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 but it, the, these people will by default be more at risk of. Mm-hmm. of poles and tears and stuff like that so you have to be very conscious of tissue quality so i would also say as a as an outside making sure that the nutrition is on point supplementation is optimized 
um, hydration, hydration, yeah. uh, like even maybe some some people might need some form of uh, manual therapy. I know you like the the sauna. All these things will help at improving tissue quality, which is really really important. And then the warm up is extremely important for velocity based type of training modalities because you need to bring up your body's core temperature if you want the tissue to be a little bit more resilient it's, it's like trying trying to uh, trying to create speed and velocity with a cold muscle is a recipe for a disaster so the warm up with that type of training is extremely important um, so 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 anyways all of this together in a very very progressive manner So you have the warm up, you have the the neural element, like you said. You have the preparation element. You have the tissue component. Then you have the progression at increasing the speed at which you lift heavy weight. All of this, by default, will improve power, like pretty drastically if you're a, if you're a non-trained individual in power. And not only this, but You know how we promote the use of intended maximal concentric acceleration, so the X and the concentric for our primary movement? Just that. Like David Bem, like the, the research he, he did in the late 80s or early 90s, I'm forgetting. <clears throat> like w all they did was for the same load and the same rep, Having the intent of accelerating a load as much as possible, irrespective of the actual velocity, because with heavy weights, you can have the intent, but the velocity will never be fast because it's heavy weights. But the intent increase your ability to exert power. I mean, in the study, what they did is they trained two groups of people. So one group that was training with no intent to go fast, one group that was training with the intent to accelerate. Same load, same rep, same set, same everything. I think it was 11 or 12 weeks later. Now, they tested the two groups with 60% of 1RM, and they measured power output. And the people, the group that trained with the intent of accelerating generated 37% more power at 60% of 1RM than the group who didn't. So that's why we like to encourage trainees in the A series of any type of strength training to use IMCA to potentiate the nervous system to become more efficient at tapping into a higher number of motor units so that they can generate more power through their concentric action. So just that, by default, combined with now learning to create or store more elastic energy during the eccentric contraction, doing the dynamic warm-up with plyos to create more tendon stiffness, and learning to converge eccentric to concentric faster, all of this improves power and we even we haven't even truly added specialty techniques and i think it's important to pay attention to this because you're not going to have a as a personal trainer you might not have a client come to you and be like i want to do power but we all know those clients who could be really into it and really have fun with it so i think as a coach it's Knowing that once you've had worked with the client long enough and then even starting to introduce the plyos into the warm up before they even like you're even starting the power training specifically stuff like that to really get them ready for it. And they don't even necessarily know that's why you're doing it, but you're switching it up. They'll enjoy it. And then you're prepping them for power training. I mean, that's a good point. Like I remember in, in St. Louis, remember Andre Benoit used to do some power with certain of his female clients. And I remember asking him what was the reasoning? And it was just, well, one, they're ready for it. But two, they're training year round all the time. It's just fun. It's a different yeah. stimulus. It's a different thing. It's, it's a fun thing to incorporate if you can. And if you're challenged by, if you, if it's something that you're interested yeah, in, that's it'll motivate you. Yeah. Primarily yeah. for me, it was, I mm -hmm. was, motivated to try something different feel 
athletic again, see if my body could withstand introducing it, seeing what would happen. And just it goes back to everything we keep tying into expressing our jackness. Like (laughs) you have to be able to move and express that in different modalities. And for me, it was like, I just want to try power training because it looks so much fun. And then if someone wants to do like some level of sprinting for their conditioning, Mm -hmm. like that all this here is massively beneficial, not in terms of you're going to perform better, which you are, but it's the, it's going to reduce your injury risk massively. If you have done the extensive warm ups and the fast recentrics before you introduce really high velocity sprinting, because if you want to hurt yourself is go from real slow <laughs> heavy weights <laughs> like. for 10 to 15 years back into sprinting with no bridge in between that's that's what's going to end you yeah and this thing uh, for gen pop for me even with the i was i started running earlier in the year before doing power training again just to introduce mm-hmm. myself to something different that i hadn't done but with power training you're not going to see massive body comp result changes with the training as much. I knew you said that to me when I said, okay, I wanted to do power training. So at least the things with sprinting being incorporated with the training, like that kind of offsets it for the gen pop people that will kind of think about that. Yeah, because one of the big things of power is you always have to remember the fitness fatigue power them. So with power, every session you have to be able to express fitness. So you cannot generate a lot of fatigue. So the be- the most important thing is you're not taking things to failure. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. once you're in the weight room, you're not taking things to failure. So it's gonna have it's gonna sacrifice the hypertrophy component to an extent. So, but this the, the, this is just part. This is part of the process. If you want to express power, you have to be fresh. You have to be able to tap into high threshold motor units. You have to have a well. Um, recovered nervous system so to do this we need to train slightly shorter failure it's not going to have the same body composition goals but that's if you're in a power phase that's not your overall goal goal. you're not saying oh i want to lose 10 percent body fat and do a power phase it's they're not the same thing yeah the volume is low you're not training to failure you always have a few reps in reserve so on a metabolic perspective it's just not the most challenging thing but you know it depends though so like if you have a extended warm-up your four strength training sessions and then you sprint on, on top of it and then it adds on yeah, in terms of still on point yeah sure. it adds on yeah. in terms of movement and, and on and on but but it's not like don't don't choose power if your <laughs> ultimate goal is changes in body yeah, composition no. it's just, it's just not the I, I know a real old school thing was it'll change your muscle tone <laughs> so uh, you, you'll look harder. You'll look. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you may, maybe if you're like ridiculously fast, which yeah, and you're shredded. I mean, then I got shredded, and I looked harder than I did the previous time I got shredded. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Science. Science. It's all those fast <laughs> <Yeah. choices. laughs> Okay, we kind of touched on a couple other subjects. I think we can go into a little bit deeper for this topic. Um, specifically you brought up supplements for power and I know you first mentioned like inflammation prior to that. So kind of our basics for inflammation, we always say fish oil. Fish oil. Well, like, oh. uh, <laughs> the metabolic elite curcumin is pretty, mm. well, pretty on I just started using that like three days ago and it was just like, <sighs> like <laughs> I don't know how to explain it, but it's just like. You know, just the inflammation, like you don't even know you're inflamed until you're not inflamed, which is like it just makes it, like the joints just feel a little bit more relaxed, like the the tissue, like the muscles are more supple, more mobility. It's kind of crazy how it really works. And I never feel supplements. I take a lot of supplements. And, and never, you're taking the, well, I guess you already, you're taking the. The BPC at the same time. The BPC 157 and the curcumin product yep. by Metabolic Elite. I will drop a link (laughs) in the (laughs) description of the episode so you can check out those products. But going back to supplements for power, so we're focusing just basic ones. You're always focusing on inflammation with the fish oil, and then you could use things like the curcumin. Yeah, but you can can even, like, for example, let's say I were 
with my background, if I were to start a a power phase, I would probably preload my phase by consuming um, like more collagen, uh, even like old school, but um, uh, uh, chondroitin. Um, uh. Glucosamine, could you can draw it in? Yeah, it's old school as hell, but all, all of these are good at creating a little bit more uh, tendon um, uh, health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like the inflammation one's more that you don't want to go into it inflamed. Yeah. Yeah. If someone's got really good tissue quality and aren't inflamed, they, that's probably an unneeded step. But yeah. if someone's going in, they're, they're considering that they're, they could be slightly inflamed, then it's a more yeah. important thing. But because because me like I I would definitely like add in some like a scoop of collagen to my pre workout if I were going to yeah and during that whole phase I was again not using products that I would normally use in my training I was using everything that helped me neurally so I was using the Neuro Prime I was using the Myo Prime for the power yeah. sessions specifically yeah so like creatine is always going to be a huge one once mm -hmm. it comes to strength or power. There's other things in Myo Prime that like so it's um ATP yeah ATP tyrosine yeah there's Chain. more it's more of a blend mm -hmm. um a good um hydration so yeah. so mm -hmm. something so it could be Element or it could be the ATP electrolytes so depend on if you need more sodium in your diet or you want uh uh less sodium dominant electrolyte. electrolyte. Mm -hmm. Um, also, like making sure your magnesium status is on point and vitamin D status is on point just for a tissue quality perspective. Vitamin C is a good one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That'll boost uh, so, but, production. Yeah, but, but those are like the details to optimize. Yeah. But but, but uh, to come back to the training component, so now we we've done all the basis to kind of get ready for power. Now, what we need to understand, like, what is power? Like, simply speaking, if, you, if we look at a continuum of maximal strength, which would be your one rep max on a concentric perspective, and sprinting, so you have strength on one side, max speed on the other side. Power would be right in the middle. So it's that perfect mixture of force and velocity. And that 50% seems to be that sweet spot. So eventually, you want to start. So you need to learn to move heavy weight fast. But eventually, for I'm talking about weight room power, you want to start moving your, your bench press, your squat, whatever it might be, faster and faster, but with lighter and lighter weights. And this is where... As you get closer, that's 50% intensity. This is where tools like accommodating resistance becomes very beneficial. So chains and bands, for example, those are my favorite go-to with gen pop in the weight room to develop power because what that does is if, if all you do Like if you're if you're training at 85% of 1RM and E20X0 and you're creating, you're generating some force and some good power, that's one thing. But the problem is the lighter the weight becomes, the more time you're spending decelerating the load in your concentric contraction than you are accelerating. So in a way, you're trying to develop power, but you're actually decreasing your ability to generate power because at that point the joint is trying to protect itself because you're accelerating a light load if you keep accelerating through full extension your elbows are going to explode so now the brain about midpoint concentrically is telling you to start to decelerate to protect the joint by incorporating accommodating resistance tools now You're not eliminating, but you're pushing away the time frame where the deceleration occurs. So instead of occurring at the 50% mark, it might only start decelerating at the 80% mark. So it's a little bit better for strength uh, development. Uh, is it the greatest thing for athletes? No, 
because in athletics, in real life athletics, you need to accelerate it to accelerate throughout. If you're throwing something, if you're jumping, if you're sprinting, you're accelerating through the entire range of motion. But in the weight room, if you want to develop power and bench, well, what's the limiting factor on bench press? The bottom. The bottom, the bottom right? So if I'm using accommodating resistance and I'm teaching myself to be better at generating more power coming off of the chest and I'm accelerating the load all the way through the first 80% and then I'm only decelerating the last 20% and I'm doing this in order to improve bench power output and or strength potential, well, I did the job because now I'm better at transitioning coming off the bottom, which will help on a max strength perspective indirectly because I taught myself to be able to recruit more motor units in that position to accelerate a load coming off of the chest. But the, the, the last quarter of that press is never a limiting factor in the weight room. So that's why I'm saying accommodating resistance for me for Gen Pop as a strength training weight room tool, it's great. But yes, it has its limitation for sports performance. But that's why we have a very specific topic with this podcast today. We're talking about gen pop in the context of weight room power development. Yeah. But uh, like a good first step before even introducing the accommodating resistance could be a load of 70 to 80% with obviously just a straight barbell weight and sub maximal reps. So say 70 to 80% and you're doing between three and five reps. This is going to be heavy enough that you're not decelerating very early on the movement, but so it's but it's going to allow enough concentric velocity that you're still tapping in the high threshold motor units. You're still going to develop power, and you're going to be sub maximal enough that you're not fatiguing throughout the set. So you're not starting to slow down. You're not starting to create fatigue from set to set. So if someone has never done accommodating resistance, this would be a nice bridge into it. So. It'd be probably three to five sets of three to five reps of 70 to 80 percent. So really sub-maximal, but explode through every rep on big primary movements. It's yeah. not going to work on a bicep curl. And yeah, it's that's, harder that's than it big. looks, right, for people. It is. Like yeah. people, like every rep, like if you have to be explosive, you have to remind them, you have to coach them. And even among ourselves when we have courses and stuff, like we have to remind the coaches to mm-hmm. really accelerate that weight. So that's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to teach yourself to be really, really, really good at generating force with about 50% of your 1RM on barbell lifts. That's power. And then we want to introduce chains before we introduce bands. So chains is just going to be a straight weight being added to the load or to the barbell as they get lifted, whereas bands, it's exponential. So say you have... 10 pounds of um, additional weight, like four inches off your chest. But at lockout, it doesn't go up that the next four inches is 20 pounds. The next four inches is 40 pounds. It It hits when it 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 hits. hits. So like you could go from 10 pounds to 60 pounds at the next four inches. So it's going to be more exponential and it's going to create more of an overspeed eccentric because you have so much Mm -hmm. more weight pulling down on the barbell as well. So you definitely want to introduce chains first and you want to use a, ch- a chain leader system or is that what it's called? A feeder, 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 feeder system, not leader. <laughs> um, so the feeder system, all that's going to do is it's going to allow you to very precisely overload the specific area of the range of motion that you want. So you're not going to have this one long chain the whole way down from the barbell. You're going to have small chain or the blast straps from Elite FTS, I think they're called. And you hook the chains on. So at the very top of the movement, you have maybe one or two links sitting on the ground. The bottom of the movement, all the chains or 95% of the chains are on the ground. So it's truly overloading the full range of motion and there's no wasted like um, yeah. weight. Yeah, those the chains that he was talking about where you have a collar and then you have the entire chain link coming down are honestly for power development, they're completely useless because you, let's say the chain weigh, weighs 20 pounds, but you only have four chain links t- touching the ground out of 25 chain links. Yeah. 
So you're 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 basically accommodating resistance with three pounds. Like w- yeah. th- th- there's no point for it. What about like the Rock when he has the long chain around his neck <laughs> and he's doing dips? It works. For yeah, that, that works for everything. It's yeah. good for a fat loss, hypertrophy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> then for chi- chain weight okay. or accommodating resistance in general, twenty percent of the barbell load or one RM seems to be roughly the sweet spot. Yeah, like you know, like a good st- ten to thirty. I know is a a good starting point would for most would be a fifty percent barbell weight yeah. with a twenty percent accommodating resistant weight. So it means that from the chest on bench, they're accelerating fifty percent, which is kind of like that sweet spot. But then as they reach full extension, they have seventy percent of their one RM. So now they're forced to accelerate a twenty percent window. Um, which is the reason why you're delaying that deceleration component because the the the, the brain is like, well, I, I can't start decelerating now because I'm having more and more force that I need to overcome. I think going, so we talked about trains, but just quickly going to bands because obviously we know a lot of students have been here to Kilo or if you follow us, you might have seen how we measure the weight of the bands which i think is important so we use a fish scale and it is is a a fish fish. scale so if you're a fisherman (laughs) you'll know that it's what you weigh when you catch a fish with you can get it on amazon they're very affordable and then you basically just set the band up as you would on the lift and then hook the band onto the fish scale and pull it to the range of motion. So yeah, the top of, the top range of, of whatever, like your benches or your squat. And then that number is the additional load we're looking at yeah, for that, the bands. That number times two. Yeah, because yeah. of both sides. Yeah. Yeah. But you want to make sure you measure both because sometimes the band one can get more slack maybe than the other. So Yeah, it's yeah that's to, the thing, right? So like – so. Because if you have multiple bands and they're not paired together, some might be used more than others and it gets, there's wear and tear. So the tension kind of like uh, changes over time. So you need to, if you're training a lot of people, I would suggest that every quarter you kind of remeasure and reassess yeah. just Keep to an make eye sure. Keep an eye on your bands. Yeah. yeah. Keep an eye on them yeah. too. Like if you have like a tough knurling on the barbell, they're going to, they're going to, Rip. 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 <laughs> Snap. Which can be. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so then for bands <laughs> as well, it's important. So while we measure the tension at the top, you also want to make sure that there's some level of tension at the bottom, bottom of the movement so the band doesn't go completely slack as well. You don't want you don't need a lot of tension, but you want some. I know when you introduced the power to me this year, I had everything on bench press and like all of my accommodating resistance was bench press and squat. For me, and we were using output to specifically measure, I know that it was frustrating, but then you guys both kind of told me that it's fine and it's normal because it was so much easier for me to always stay within the velocity range or hit the numbers I should on squat versus bench. I could, but I wasn't as consistent, and it was harder on bench to well, always be within the, it. The problem, I mean, Porik will will expand on this after, but the problem with with um, uh, VBT devices is that all of the data in regards to velocity zones have been applied to the deadlift and squat to the point where even the bench press was part of the research but the bench press never matched the velocity so they kind of discarded the bench press so Yes, we know that 0.75 to 1.0 meters per second is great for explosive strain, but on squat and deadlift, on incline bench, yeah, say it won't, it's not, it won't, it doesn't, that's the problem with that. So you can't necessarily use these windows for everything and think that, okay, all I need to do is be at 0.75 for everything. It just doesn't, that's the limitation of these devices. So we still use it as a gauge. Okay. So now on bench, you're going at 0.62, let's say fine at 50% of one RM fine. Now, all you need to do to become more powerful is guess what? (laughs) Beat that. Beat that with that same weight. Yeah. Okay, so that's how we use this because 
in the past, me, when I train athlete, these devices did not exist. We, we went to the coach's Back eye, but, in the day. but, <laughs> but it, it, <laughs> it's very, very hard to be precise when you don't have that feedback. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Cause more and more now the numbers coming out for upper body lifts are significantly different for mm. than lower body lifts. I'm sure there's a lot of factors. One very obvious factor is you're not traveling through the same range of motion. Yeah. So you don't have the same amount of time to reach those higher velocities. So I agree we can use those zones as a goal and a target, but let the percentages dictate the load and then just beat whatever yeah, velocity score you've got. Time. Yeah, because yeah. if you're getting too obsessed with hitting a very, very specific velocity number, like especially if you have like a small window, say it's a 0.75 to 0.8, like a very small window, you're you're really going to limit yourself in power output and the you're way safer off just use percentages to dictate the load and just make sure you're beating that number. Like I'll give you an example. So let's say you, your client is CeeLo Green. Okay. 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 <laughs> let's see where this is going. <laughs> and then you have CeeLo Green doing bench press with bands. Wow. And you're looking at velocity. He's inflamed. <laughs> <laughs> but CeeLo Green will most likely be incapable of hitting 0.75 meters per second with 50% of 1RM because his arms are six inches long. <laughs> so he doesn't have enough time to generate that type of velocity. <laughs> But in order for him to be able to hit 0.75, He could do it, but with 20% of 1RM. Now, the problem is if we're working at 20% of 1RM, at 0.75, are we really working explosive strength? No, because the load is too light. CeeLo yeah. okay. will not get his biggest training goals. Yeah, so, so CeeLo needs to go heavier, slower, but as long as he beats his slower time every, each and every time, he's more powerful. Like one, another way you could do it is if you really want to try and like narrow it in is you can see what um, weight you create the highest peak power at because yeah. like things like output will give you that metric. So say at 55% on your bench press, you create peak power. Okay, you're going to use 55% and just try and accelerate that faster because that same weight going faster is going to increase the peak power output. So that'll be, that could be another way of trying to narrow in the window but it doesn't account for when you want to train the whole continuum it would just be very much that peak power zone which there's nothing wrong with that zone it's just if you want to a, a broader expression of power you need to train other zones as well so on the to continue with the short arm scenario <laughs> With CeeLo. So, with CeeLo. So, let's say we're training Liam, who's seven feet tall, and he's squatting. Like, he's not going to be able to be super powerful, but he's... Well, he, well, he has, he has, really, a, really he has a... But he has a ton of Range potential of to No, I know, but it's it. not... Like, what's his number going to be versus someone oh, but, who's short? You'd be like, yeah, so, like, technically, to stay within the zones, he's going to need a heavier load. So you're going to have to reduce the z or like change the zone for him to match the if you want to match like the overall strain of the session, like the fatigue that's generated within the session. Because like say someone is going in their five five, so they're squatting um, a lighter weight and they're squatting less range of motion, mm -hmm. but they can hit at fifty percent. They can hit point eight meters per second. Whereas him, he's going in. And with 50%, he's hitting one meter per second. So he's like, oh, you need more load, more load, mm -hmm. more load. So he's not only squatting a higher percentage of his body weight, he's doing it for a longer range of motion. Like so. he has the limb length mm -hmm. to have the potential to generate more force because he's going to be under tension for a longer period of time. But we don't know. Maybe, maybe he's neurally super inefficient and very yeah. slow, which then will affect yep. that. So we don't know that part. It's yeah. like, man, and, I, and this is not a joke. In high school, uh, in track, we had a kid in our class that ran the 100 meter in 28 seconds. 
<laughs> was it CeeLo Green? <laughs> it was not. <laughs> so, but but that just so that like that guy neurally he just had nothing, yeah. right? Yeah. So somebody so there is always the, these neural physiological factors, but on a pure biomechanics perspective, a taller person with longer limbs can potentially generate generate more, more because there's more time of expre- to express that yeah. that speed. That's why that's why with the with athletes at one point uh, it's it becomes really really important to train uh, rate of force development because you need to teach the athlete to be more efficient at generating force in a very very short time frame. So elite athletes can be really really powerful with no range, but our gen pop it it won't be the case. And this this can lead to another topic. So with power development in the context of gen pop in the weight room. The, the peak power zone is the holy grail. But it doesn't mean that at one point you might want to, to dive in for a phase or two in reactive strength development. Will it have a huge direct correlation with improving max strength or, or power on bench and squat? Not necessarily, but indirectly, yes. Because at one point, if you start plateauing, because... Power is the, the, the product of uh, force and velocity. So at one point, if you're plateauing with your power, you might want to go dip into the uh, velocity end of the spectrum and do a phase or two with some uh, type of plyo work or jumps or, or, or light throws and stuff like that to work the central nervous system and the tissue in a completely different end of the spectrum to now allow yourself to break that plateau once you get back to your true power zone so uh, with the gen pop i don't think it's a huge component but it's something that you can definitely consider to dip in once in a while not only to make the training more interesting but to emphasize that power output if you do hit a plateau but for the most part i think most of that plyo work will be done in the uh, dynamic warm-up yeah Are there considerations for the rest of the workout you'd think about when you're training gen pop for power? So I had the accommodating resistance, the power on my A series. So are there things that you're paying close attention to for the B and C and what you're incorporating it in? Yeah. So one question I often have people are confused with this is the, like, again, we're, I'm bringing this up again, but there's a huge difference on how a training session for power looks with an athlete's compared to a training session for gen pop in the weight room. So whenever I introduced power for you, for example, your training session structure looked exactly the same as everything we teach in program design of uh, our level one. Yeah. It's the same structure. The only difference is depending on your level, you might, like I like to first include the power movement in the B series. So you do your max strength work first rehearse the movement especially if you're more novice to low intermediate and then you subject yourself to power in the b series once you're warmed up blah 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 but also you're doing less sets okay and the overall load will be a little less now as you're progressing through time then you move your power movement to the a series right after your dynamic warm-up Now, now you have more sets allocated to it. You're a little bit more fresh. So now you can really, really work on building power. Now, if the power element is in the A series, now you need to make sure that your B and C series, you're not training to failure. I would say on, as a general rule, keep two reps in reserve. If you're really good with your uh, RIR like assessment, Leave two reps in reserves for B and C, but it, it can stay the exact same. And then eventually, you can even do a power modality in the A series and a power modality of lesser speed in the B series. So, for example, you could be doing bands at 50% with 20% chains in, in the A series 
and do just like fast. Yep. Like, uh, 70% of one RM for sets of six, a fast press, for example. Yep. And one other thing for the program design is to make sure you're still training the areas that might cause issues. So like shoulder medials, low back, abs. So they make sure they're all addressed in the C-series. Again, the more advanced you get, and say you're doing um, two different power speed-based exercises in the MB series, the C-series might move to just a normal strength exercise. That That's fine because you're way more advanced at that stage and those areas of breakdown are normally well-addressed. Okay. So... Is there anything on introducing power training to Gen Pop you wanted to touch on? I think we I think we covered it. Like it's simpler than what people think. People sometimes overcomplicate it. Um, I and just, I think that's just something that people are confused what power specifically is in the like, weight room. Yeah, yeah, I, yes. But it's not it's not necessarily that people are confused about what is power. They're just confused on how to apply it and integrate it with the regular folks because the problem is the majority of the information we get on power training comes from the sporting world. But then if you're trying to apply sports training modalities with your gen pup, then it becomes a little weird. Uh, It becomes a little riskier and it becomes less relevant. So our goal with this podcast was really to, hey, guys, with gen pup, it's super simple. Use everything that you've learned from Kilo. Just work progressively at teaching the client to be better at lifting heavy weights fast first. Build joint resiliency, tendon resiliency with slow eccentric first. Build elasticity or joint uh, tendon stiffness with some low grade plyos as a warm up. And then slowly start to integrate that power. But the power doesn't need, doesn't need to be the super complex, explosive strength, starting strength, reactive strength. Like it, it doesn't need to be that because to truly benefit your weight room lifts, working at that peak power zone seems to be the, the sweet spot. Uh, and then it's, it's a fun change of pace. You introduce it once in a while and it, it's just good. It's, it's good neurally. It also... In a way, it kind of deloads you from the grind of a hypertrophy macro or absolute strength macro, which just pounds you and runs you through the ground. So to me, if you're at that level, it's a almost a good way to, uh, I don't want to say active recovery, but yeah. a, a, almost in a way, it allows okay. you to recover from the grind and of the other things the because yeah. you're working on a different end of the spectrum of the strength training world. But it's a it's a world that's super interesting that I think is untapped. And again, we have the specialty technique course. And sometimes because of this, I think that people are taking some of these elements, but they're misapplying it or using it with the wrong crowd. So you just need to be very clever or conscious or cautious Cautious. about who and when you're using it. (laughs) Okay, so tomorrow we are starting our final courses for 2024. We start with the fat loss intensive, then over the weekend have the hypertrophy set intensive. Next week we have the specialty technique, and then we wrap up with the strength assessment workshop. So as always, remember that our 2025 schedule is out. I have a stack of registrations. I think there's a little over 30 people already registered for courses next year. And as we know, that Early bird pricing ends December 2nd, so you still have time to take advantage of $500 off all of our 2025 courses. We look forward to seeing everyone who's joining us over the next few weeks and everyone next year. Thanks for tuning in. Like, subscribe, leave us a comment. See you next time, fam.